Good evening. Good evening, saints. Welcome to our virtual Bible study. I am actually doing this Bible study live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and down here at the conference. And uh, it's a joy to uh, just to do this Bible study with you all. I'm thankful for Les being able to uh, coordinate this and be able to still have our Bible study tonight. Uh, I, I have to say, honestly, uh, coming off of vacation and everything, just ready to get back to the work of ministry and and so I, I, uh, I, I, I'm happy to be here with you all tonight. And part of my heart as a pastor, Lord's given me a pastor's heart, and and I love Main Street. And so, uh, even though we can't meet in person, or at least we're we're, we're looking to do that, Lord willing, that September, uh, this is still a good blessing just to see you all. And and I pray, Lord, has blessed your day, and and uh, it's a uh, it's just a joy just to fellowship around the Word. I, I pray that uh, your hearts are ready for. Lord, to speak to us this evening uh, from Holy Scripture. I uh, just want to just begin as we do each week with prayer. And if you all have some prayer requests, please, I just want to just continue to encourage you. Let us know what you stand in need of. Uh, part of your prayer request, when you ask, we actually get to participate in seeing what God is doing in your life. Amen. And, and as I, I, uh, I'm thankful for the discipline of, of my prayer journal, uh, given to me on our on my 10th anniversary at Main Street and and so I uh, I'm almost halfway through this uh, with with prayer requests and answers and so uh, it's just a a commitment on my part when I say I'm gonna pray for you I'm, I'm committed to that we're committed to that as a church and so please when there's any prayer concerns that you might have forward those to the church uh, let's put up my email uh, well yeah forward it to the church so we can have that uh, insert it in the bulletin as well as in the observations and we'll make sure that uh, we get that we pray for you and that you follow up with us just to let us know how the Lord has blessed you how the Lord has worked uh, just a couple of prayer concerns that I want to mention tonight uh, please put on your prayer list brother Gary Haley just some health concerns uh, just lift him up before the Lord if you can uh, also be in prayer for brother Corey Edmonds and the evangelistic team and the saints of uh, and our saints as we go out to do evangelism on this coming Thursday at six o'clock at Douglas Park. Uh, let's just pray for the Lord to move in a mighty way. There are people out there who are in sin like we used to be in sin, right? And, and we were lost one time and God used someone to lead us to himself. And so let's pray that God was super providence. He would draw people to come to Douglas Park on Thursday evening at six and that the Lord would use uh, Brother Corey Edmond and Brother Mark Bernard and those who are volunteering uh, in our outreach just to just to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and God will open up people's hearts to receive our Lord and and bring uh, sheep into the church, amen, sheep uh, into the flock. So please just be in prayer for our evangelistic team and let's support in the best way we can as they go out on Thursday, amen. I mention this every Sunday, uh, just the three aspects of the purpose of the church uh, to worship the Lord, upreach. Uh, we are saved to worship God through Jesus Christ. Also, another important aspect of church life is, uh, we call it upreach, worship, uh, inreach, edification. So as we come together as a body of Christ, uh, as a pastor, I don't have all the spiritual gifts. Uh, so God, through the Spirit, has equally distributed to Main Street all the spiritual gifts necessary for the spiritual health and development of the body. And so there are those in our church who have the gift of helps, gifts of administration, gifts of leadership, teaching gifts, um, all these various gifts. And, and when we come together, uh, we encourage and edify. There's even those who just have this, the Lord's spirit of prayer, amen, and exhortation, and those who give liberality. And so we want to continue to commune together, meet together. And let uh, the Lord use us as we utilize our spiritual gifts for each, each other's edification. Then thirdly, of course, is evangelism. Uh, we got upreach, worship, inreach, edification, outreach, evangelism. And that's another important aspect of a healthy church is fulfilling that great commission, going out and sharing the love of Jesus Christ uh, with a lost world. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I'll say this and then we'll get into our prayer time. It's just a thought. You know, uh, and as, as pastor, you know, my responsibility is to kind of help maintain a, a, a biblical God-centered perspective on life. I know I do it for my own particular health and spiritual stability, and I always want to 
convey those things to you. You know, when we're listening to the news and everything, uh, I always want you to think, uh, as we think about events that happen in our world, this particularly our nation with the mass shootings, there are those who come with their commentary, those who will give their perspective. And typically the perspective is gonna be more secular, uh, uh, more God denying. And, you know, uh, some would say that the problem in our nation is, is, is guns. And, you know, what the real problem in our nation is, there's a lot of bad people with weapons and innocent people who feel defenseless. And we live in a world like that. And the recent shooting that took place in Indiana, uh, one of the young ladies that was able to escape, she said, I'll never go to a mall again. I, I, my, my world has just been, that sense of safety and security has been violated. And when we go out and share the gospel, we live in a world where it's hopeless. People have no sense of hope. People are frightened, insecure, confused. And here it is, it's the only hope that we can offer that even though all of us is just a step away from death, we don't know when our time will be where God will call us home, but at least we're ready. But there are many people in the world who are not ready. They are afraid of death. They're afraid. And when we go out and share the gospel, we hope uh, through Jesus Christ. So please be in prayer for our evangelism team on Thursday and come out and support a man and let the Lord use you in a mighty way. That's, that's my, my, uh, my exhortation to you this evening. With that, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord this evening. Father, we bless you. We thank you for our time tonight, asking that, Lord God, you know our various concerns. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're always searching our hearts. And Father, you're always searching our hearts. And Holy Spirit, you're always interceding for us to the Father, according to the Father's will. And therefore, we can have that assurance, as Romans 8, 28 says, that you're going to cause all things to work together for good. Why? Because the Spirit is praying for our good, and you're, you're listening to the Spirit's intercession, Father, for our good, and therefore we are assured that all things will work together for the good, no matter what it is that we're going through right now, any, any fears or uncertainties, stress, uh, worry, uh, just to be reminded, uh, even though sometimes we don't even know how to pray, we're so overwhelmed, but the Spirit is interceding for us, and the Father, you're listening, and therefore we are assured that you're going to cause all things that the Spirit is praying on our behalf to you to work out for our good. I pray that will be an encouragement. I pray, oh God, that you will be with Brother Gary Haley and his health concerns, that you will be with Brother Corey Edmonds and Mark Bernard and those who are involved in our evangelism team, that you would use them in a mighty way to plant seeds of the gospel. And we pray, oh God, that you will give the increase. Lord, thank you for through her surgery and uh, and, and her being able to get out today, Lord. Thank you for her. Thank you uh, for others in our congregation that you have answered their prayers. Thank you for being a comforter to those who are grieving in our church. Thank you for being our wisdom, oh God, when we don't have a sense of direction. Thank you for prompting us, oh God, to seek your face in prayer and prompting us to study your word, Lord, because we realize that apart from you, we can do nothing. And we ask tonight that you would superintend our Bible study, that you would sanctify us in thy truth, your word is truth. We bless you for this time. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Uh, again, I ask and covet your all, you all's prayers. I will be uh, preaching tomorrow evening uh, down here in Chattanooga, so please be in prayer for me uh, and that the Lord will get the glory. Before we begin tonight, we always want to open up for any questions that you might have, uh, if, things that you may be studying, uh, maybe things that were shared on Sunday, need further clarification on. Let's open up the floor for any questions. Now, again, uh, if you're on mute and you have your video on, you have to unmute yourself and, and then state your question. If you are, if you don't have your video on, you can type your question uh, in the chat. Now, for those of us who may not be Zoom savvy, uh, Les will also put my email up. And again, during the week, if you have any questions, just email me. I'll do my best to answer the questions the best way I can. Any questions this evening? Sister Linda Williams has her hand raised. If uh, Les can unmute her or, or Linda unmute herself. Uh, yes, Pastor, you were talking about uh, Calvinism, Calvinism, and I was wondering, what's the difference between Arminians and um, Calvinists and hyper-Calvinists? 
Oh, good, good question. So what's the difference between Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism? Hyper-Calvinism, um, it, it really almost, it goes to an extreme, goes beyond, I would say, it, would, it goes beyond what the scriptures teach, almost eliminating human responsibility. So like, just for instance, for evangelism, uh, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's the unwillingness to maintain the tension between a sovereign God and human responsibility. So hyper-Calvinism, when it comes to evangelism, would pretty much downplay evangelism. God's going to save his elect no matter what. Uh, and that's a dangerous thing because it goes against the command of scripture. It goes against the command of the Great Commission. So a hyper-Calvinist would... Um, uh, be somewhat, when it comes to evangelism, reluctant to evangelize. Uh, Hyper-Calvinists would, uh, let's say, in the area of, I don't want to misrepresent. I, I would just say that I think the key part of, of hyper-Calvinism has been most expressed in the area of evangelism. And uh, um, not oftentimes, because of course, God's gonna save who he wants to save, we don't have to be as responsible Christians as the Bible clearly commands in sharing the gospel. Uh, that, you know, we don't even know who the elect are, right? And, and so uh, hyper-Calvinism would also say, mm, God doesn't love, God only loves the elect. So when you go out and share the gospel and you use John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, you may be misrepresenting God. Uh, but there's scriptures that talk about God's love and it's, it's evangelistic in nature. Um, Jesus in Matthew chapter five, as you remember, as he, he begins to clarify the law and you have heard, and he's dealing with the Pharisees and scribes interpretation of the law, the 10 commandments, but I say unto you, uh, under the authority, of God's true intention when he gave the law. And you get down towards the end of chapter five, he says, you have heard, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, bless those who despitefully use you. Why? For your father causes his son, S-U-N, to shine on the just and the unjust. He causes his rain to fall down on the good and the wicked. And so why does God give common grace? Why does he bless sinners? Why does he give them breath and food and clothing and houses? Uh, not because God is materialistic in nature. Uh, God blesses sinners, even those who would never believe, as an evangelistic perspective, is to bring them to repentance, as we looked at, uh, as, or as I don't know if we looked at it last week, but as it states in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. So hyper-Calvinists would say, uh, God only loves the elect. He doesn't love the reprobate. Um, and uh, as far as evangelism is concerned, uh, because they can't reconcile it in their mind, it, becomes, it does not become a priority of the church. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, Arminians. Are Arminians saved? Because R.C. Scroll said they're barely saved. What is... <laughs> Yeah, Arminianism, uh, Jacob Arminius was a, a person back during the time of Calvin who, who talked about or used this phrase, prevent pre grace. Prevent grace meant that, yes, God saves, but he cannot save apart from the cooperation of the sinner. So I have to give God permission to save me, if I can just kind of summarize it in a way. And um, uh, that, that, of course... Again, trying to reconcile the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. The gospel commands us to believe and to repent. That's a command. But we understand believe unless God opens up the heart. John 6, 44, uh, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up. But that doesn't negate the fact that God also says, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins in John chapter 8, verse 24. Mm -hmm. So it's a both and, even though I can't reconcile it in my mind, and Spurgeon said the sovereignty of God and human responsibility, why are we trying to reconcile friends? In other words, it's perfectly harmonious in the mind of God, even though we may not be able to understand it. There are things about the Lord that are a mystery to us. We can't reconcile. I think the point 
Reformed theology. We want to go as far as the scripture go and not beyond that. We don't want to go beyond what's written. So in Jacob Arminius, is it possible for a, a person uh, to have a very low view of God's sovereignty and be saved? Yes, I would say that. I would say that when I became a believer, I, I, I fought against the sovereignty of God in a sense when I, you know, when I read uh, Romans 9, I didn't think that you know, I, I believe that I cooperated with God. I mean, I heard the gospel, I, I believed, and I repented. I went forward. Uh, but little did I know that uh, I think the key to the whole point of salvation is that we typically minimize man's depravity, man's sinfulness. And that's where you get in the Arminian view. Uh, there's only really three descriptions. And this, this is actually <clears throat> current with how we evaluate uh, crime and violence in our nation. There's only really three views you can have of man. Man is either good and, uh, and yet um, he does things that um, are really not of him. You know, he's a good person. We hear, we hear people say that he's a really good person, even though that bad thing, that's not really that person. That's not me. You know, it's, sort of, it's a view of man that man is well. Then there's a view that man is sick. Um, and... And so how we look at crime, we'll say that person has mental illness. What, what, what is the mental illness? We always identify uh, an illness with a particular sort of medical term. So mental illness is just mental illness. It's the person just, and that, that's how we are. We really are essentially good, but we just do things sometimes. So we're sick and we need to be medicated. The Bible would say that we're dead. We're sinners and we're dead in sin. And the deadness simply means that we are uh, bent on doing that which is against the will of God. Deadness is that we don't we don't acknowledge nor feel that we're accountable to God um, for the way we live. We suppress that. And so when someone uh, and we see how it's it's even people who are not even psych psychiatrists who weigh in on a shooting before they even get the answers. That person's mentally ill. How do you know? How do you know that person mentally ill? <laughs> How do you give a diagnosis without doing an examination? Uh, but the Bible would say that the reason why we do these things, and Jesus would say out of the heart, uh, and uh, I think it's Mark chapter seven, out of the heart comes adultery, fornication, murder. So the Lord would say in his diagnosis that sin comes from the heart. It doesn't come from a from violence on television. It comes from the heart. And he is holding us responsible as human beings. We have a mind, a will, and emotions. And we determine, we deliberate, we willfully. Now, there may be some outward temptations, but we decide to, to, to give in to those temptations and commit those acts of sin. And if we don't hold to that reality, then we don't have a justice system. You know, we, we're, we're, we're looking to vote for Sister Diane. We want, to, we want a sound justice system. We have to hold people accountable. If you don't hold people accountable, then, then Romans 13 says, then the wicked flourish and the, and the innocent, are, they, feel, they feel helpless. They feel defenseless. So, so when someone's committing domestic violence, if that person just has mental illness and, and, and well, we're not going to actually penalize him for his actions, then that, that woman, that child in the house gets abused even more right? So God set up government for the protection of the innocent and the, 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 the punishment of those who do evil. And, and, and that's a restraint. That's a restraint. So in fact, you know, um, you know, penitentiary, you know, comes, it, it's just a big word for penitence. A person goes to prison, they ought to be penitent. They ought to be broken over the things that they've done. They have to come to the realization, I'm responsible for my crime. And when you have a, a society that acknowledges that we do do wrong, then there's hope for the gospel. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, Jacob, the Arminianism really doesn't fully believe what the scriptures teach concerning the, the fallenness of man. Man is fallen. We, we are fallen. We can't get up. Only God can raise us up. God can only, and the only good that we do is because of God's uh, common grace. Apart from God's common grace, his restraint, we would all be like the generation uh, during the time of Noah, just doing what was right in our own eyes. Um, so I hope that answers that. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, Pastor, I do want to point out um, that uh, they cannot unmute themselves. You have to either wave your hand so I can see you and I will unmute you, or you can put your question in the chat. Good. Good. Any other questions? Thank you, Brother Les. 
Okay. All right. Well, let's get to our study this evening. We, we are, and I'll have Les put up the, uh, our sort of outline for our study on what is Reformed theology, the foundations uh, of Reformed theology, just as a reminder, just so you can track along uh, with me as we go through each section. Uh, R.C. Sproul's book, What is Reformed Theology, is what we're dealing with. This is where our study is. And then we have the, the outline of the foundations of Reformed theology. So just in a nutshell, if you were to describe what Reformed theology is, we would say first and foremost is centered on God. So uh, we, we, we say the word theology, uh, ology, that, 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 that suffix is the study of. Theo uh, comes from the Greek word theos, and theos means God. So it's the study of God. Uh, we, we, we don't study, this is not a study of religion, which is more uh, the focus on man as a worshiper and the culture and dynamics and taboos within a society that makes man religious. We're not focusing on man. Uh, Reformed theology is centered on God, too, is based on God's word alone. So we have established an authority there. Uh, God's word alone is the authority. It's not God's word plus tradition. It's not God's word plus man's word or man's opinion. Uh, Reformed theology is based on God's word alone. Two, it's committed to faith alone. Faith alone is, is uh, uh, simply means that salvation is by faith alone, not faith, not faith plus works. It's not, not something you do to try to earn or merit God's favor. It's, it's faith alone. That's the doctrine of justification. And then fourthly, it's devoted to Jesus Christ, devoted to Jesus Christ. Now, there is a fifth foundation. If you have the book, it, it, it's going to deal with covenant theology. I stopped there because, uh, again, what, am, what I'm sharing with you all in the foundation of Reformed theology, uh, I want to go as far as the scripture goes. So when it comes to various systems uh, within the study of theology, uh, various uh, uh, subject matters that the word of God addressed, we want to follow what the Apostle Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. We don't ever want to go beyond what's written, okay? And the question that Sister Linda asked about these are different schools of thoughts like Jacob Arminius, so, and hyper-Calvinism. How do you get to these various views? Oftentimes, um, we use our own rationale, our own philosophy, uh, our own subjective reasoning, and we impose that on the scripture. And what we want to do, you know, um, and you've heard these phrases before, what I try to do in my study each week is a study before I, I write my sermon, I read the text, uh, I translate the text out of the original language, and I begin to do a grammatical historical, literary, contextual study of the text. What is all that, Pastor? Well, grammatical means that I study the words within that verse. For God so loved the world. So for <laughs> God, I'm, I'm, I'm studying the words and their meaning. Um, and within that grammatical context or study, I'm showing the relationship with words. The relationship with words means syntax. So for for in, in typically in the Greek, the gar there in the Greek typically is an explanation or a reason. Uh, in our English, we'll say, um, um, I, I tell the boys, you know, as we're leaving the house, I, I want you um, to make sure that the doors are locked when we leave and that the house is alarmed, you know, and everything before you go to bed for it's important for you. Here's the reason. It's important for you to make sure that the house is well secure, right? It gives a reason and an explanation uh, to the command. Uh, so when I'm studying, I'm, I'm looking at the grammar. I'm looking at the history. Uh, what did it mean to the original audience when Jesus said this, for God so loved the world? Um, I'm also looking at the context contextually, what was said before, what was said afterwards. And I'm saying, and I'm looking at a literary. A literary. literary means, well, uh, what uh, what sort of a genre or kind of literature was John three sixteen written in? It was it's written in a narrative, the Gospel of John. Uh, so that that affects my interpretation. So when we deal with theology, um, and it's centered on God, Reformed theology, based on God's word alone, uh, committed to faith alone, and devoted to Jesus Christ, uh, we want to make sure that all of that is representative of clearly what the Bible says. And that's what we call exegesis. We want to get the meaning out of the Bible. Eisegesis means you put your thoughts into the Bible. This is what, it, and it's always dangerous when you do a Bible study when somebody says what this means to me. 
You ever been in a situation like that? You're sitting somewhere in a group Bible study and everyone goes around and says, well, to me it says, well, it don't matter what to you it says, because that this the Bible, this document is over 2,000 years old. It had a meaning before you arrived. And the, it's the God intended meaning. As one preacher said, the meaning of the scripture is the scripture. So we believe the Bible is the scripture. If you want to understand the scripture, you got to get the meaning right. And the question is, what did God mean? And what did the writer mean uh, when he wrote it? And that's the study uh, that we also want to apply to theology. I hope that's clear. And so tonight, you know, as we go through those points, we're, we're studying within the realm of what the Bible says. And we get to the, the, the fifth point of covenant theology. I'll get into that and into why we would not subscribe to that. And somebody would say, well, we don't really consider you all the way reformed. I don't really care about a label. I want to be biblical. That's my only concern as a pastor, my only concern as a Christian. I just want to be biblical, not trying to fit into some particular group, uh, some particular tribe, okay? So last week, we covered the attributes of God a little bit, did a little bit of an overview of the attributes of God, the quality of God. And um, we mentioned in our study, and we're on page eight, if you're following along, that God we can never know God comprehensively, right? We can't know God completely, but we can apprehend God. We can know him to the degree that he's revealed himself. Uh, God will always remain infinite. We will always remain finite. We, we just, we're limited. God is unlimited, right? So there are aspects of God we can understand because he revealed himself to us from Genesis to Revelation. Now we can understand that, uh, uh, God is self-sufficient. That means God does not need anything outside of himself. <laughs> God does not need anything outside of himself for existence and fulfillment or happiness. Can you imagine that? If you, it, it's, it's the word, uh, the theological term is aseity or aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. A-S-E-I-T-Y. It's in your notes. The doctrine of aseity means that God is self-dependent, that God is self-sufficient that God does not need love outside of himself. He doesn't need uh, anything outside of himself for existence and fulfillment. So when we say, uh, uh, as a song, uh, I heard, my wife and I listened to a song coming down here. Uh, we need to lift up the name of Jesus. We need to glorify him. We need to make his praise. Uh, um, and uh, we need to magnify him. Um, and there are certain terms and in the mind in our minds we say magnify we can almost interpret that to mean we have to add something to god that god doesn't have we have to make him great no magnify god means that we ought to recognize him for who he already is we can't make god great we can't make god glorious he's already glorious we need to recognize that that's what worship simply is worship is responding to how god has already revealed himself and so sometimes when people think that way um you, you see the praise becomes sort of, if, when you, if your theology is like that, we have to give God something that he lacks, then, then worship becomes a pep rally, right? Give God some praise in here. Stand up on your feet and you try to get people motivated because you think, okay, God is lacking. If you want this worship service to be all that it is, you've got to give God something he's lacking. And when praises go up, blessings come down. So the more praises go up and we magnify and give God what he needs, he'll give us what we want. But that's not, that's idolatry. That's a misrepresentation of who God is. God is self-sufficient. He does not need anything. He did not create us out of necessity, church. He created us for to put his glory on display. Are you following me tonight? Now, 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 let me, when we hold to that and acknowledge that, scripture becomes even more profound when we read it. Turn to John chapter four. John chapter four. This is what makes salvation so profound when we just understand that God is self-sufficient, God is self-dependent, God needs nothing outside of himself. He is perfectly, completely, and eternally filled within himself. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are complete, right? Okay, so God doesn't need your love in order to feel good about himself. Uh, we're going to skip down to verse 21 to verse 24. Uh, God doesn't need your love to make him feel good about himself. Um, God does not need your praise to make him feel good about himself. Uh, God doesn't need uh, anything from you. 
okay? All right, but here's the profound part. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, John chapter four, verse 21, woman, believe me, an hour is coming where neither in this mountain, mountain in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the father. You worship that which you do not know, verse 22. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, but an hour is coming, that hour is referring to the cross, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit, that's the mind, the will, and emotions, and truth, that's the word of God, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. That's powerful. God, who does not need anything, seeks us to be his worshipers. That's a powerful statement. God seeks our worship. He doesn't need our worship, but he seeks our worship. And what is worship? Worship is basically us responding to the goodness and grace of God in Jesus Christ. I worship because the blessing had already came down in Jesus. And, and so God does what he does to put himself on display. God is so um, self-sufficient in himself that he just wants to put it on display. God wants to show off. Okay, that's what he did in Egypt. I raised, he told Pharaoh, this reason I raised you up, that I might put my glory on display. I allowed you, I put you in that office. I made your nation the greatest on the earth. And I put my people under your rulership. And I, and I allowed you to be sinful enough to, to enslave them and be cruel to them so that they might pray to me to deliver them and that I send Moses to rescue them. You know, in the sport of boxing, um, there's, a, there's a phrase that is used by someone who's undefeated. They're referred to as the undisputed champion. Uh, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. This person is the champion. They, it's, not the, it's not up for dispute. They have done all the requirements necessary as a boxer uh, to make themselves champ. They won all the belts. Um, God is the undisputed champion in the universe. And, and, and God has no, he has no competitors. So what does he do? He makes competitors. <laughs> I ain't got nobody, no one can defeat me. Um, and I just want to put my glory on display that I cannot be defeated. So I'll, I'll, I'll make up opponents. I'll put Pharaoh on his throne and I'll defeat him. I'll put Nebuchadnezzar on his throne. I'll defeat him. I'll put Pilate in office. I'll defeat him. I'll make Lucifer, knowing that Lucifer will dishonor me and I will remove him from heaven and I will allow him to exist and do evil against me so I can show myself as the undisputed champion. I, I wrote these notes uh, just as, as a way of reminder for us. We deal with the sovereignty of God in our study. Um, because God, follow me on this, because God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants, doesn't mean that God has no opposition. Follow me on this. The devil is God's enemy, right? Jesus said he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the ruler of this world. He's the father of lies. The world is God's enemy. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, don't love anyone who's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So if you're a friend of the world, and, and that means you're an enemy of God. What makes, what makes the world? What, what does that say about the world? The world is an enemy of God. And God, God, God doesn't like our flesh. He don't like that sinful part of us, right? But what makes the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God? Um, so, so we know the enemies, right? Um, but what the sovereignty of God does is makes his enemies who do not comply with his will that's revealed end up doing his will secretly. In other words, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. How do we identify the enemies of God? The enemies of God don't want to do what the Bible says. They don't want to worship God. Uh, they, they, they want to murder when God says do not murder. They want to commit adultery when God says don't commit adultery. They want to lie when God says don't bear false witness. They want to covet, covet when God says do not covet. Uh, they, they want to disrespect parents when the Bible says honor your father and mother. They want to commit idolatry when the Bible says don't worship anything besides me. 
So those are God's enemies that go against his revealed will, right? What shows God's sovereignty over them is that even though they don't do his revealed will, that makes them, you know, his enemies, they end up doing his secret will. That shows how God's the undisputed champion, that for this reason, Pharaoh, I raised you up, that I might put my glory on display. Pharaoh did not know that the 10 plagues were going to come and that eventually he would give in at the 10th plague. And when he came to himself, he still thought, I could defeat this God of these little slaves. I will get all of my army and I'll go after him. And you know what? Pharaoh was going against God's revealed will, let my people go. He did not know God's secret will was to set him up to go after Israel, put Israel between the Red Sea and the Egyptians so that Israel would look up and say, God delivers us. And God parts a Red Sea, brings his people through. Pharaoh had the nerve to say, I'm a, I see this Red Sea parting. I know it's the God of Israel fighting on their behalf. I'm going to go through that. And you know how God, God fights? God, God, God's the undisputed champion. He don't fight fair. They start going, and guess what God do? God start moving their chariot wheels. <laughs> they, can't, they can't get through. And he starts just turning their chariot wheels, and they get stuck in the mud. That didn't happen to Israel. And then he brings the water back and cover them up. And Israel's like, wow, our God is an awesome God. Chapter uh, 15 of Exodus, our God is holy. They start speaking and, and praising God they're really acknowledging what they already witnessed. They're not making God great. They're only acknowledging his greatness that he put on display. And that's the type of worshiper God seeks. Those who already seen his glory put on display and say, our God is great. There's nothing too difficult for our God. So when God puts us in a fix, God already in his secret will already determined how to bring the deliverance to put himself on display. And you know, all of us, whether it be you go to the doctor, you get a test, and you find yourself at a low point, you're wondering how this is going to turn out. Uh, I got a heart blockage or uh, there is a there is a some type of tumor uh, in my body. Uh, I don't know what that is. There's a lump. Uh, is it cancerous? I don't know. And then what do you do? You start praying. You start praying. Why do you pray? Because you know God is great and you know he's the only one that can deliver. And God delivers so you can turn back and acknowledge his greatness and give him the praise. And so God, God is self-sufficient. That's what the self-sufficiency looks like. He needs nothing outside of himself. So why does God do what he do to put himself on display, to show himself for who he really is, that we might worship him in spirit and in truth? That's what worship is. Worship every Sunday is coming and acknowledging who God already is. We're not adding something that God somehow or another does not have. That, that's why we need to remember his testimonies and what he has done in our lives. That brings out worship. We are too quick. And I, I have to acknowledge in my own life, I'm so fast to move from the problem that I had, God answers that prayer, and then I run to my next problem. <laughs> and I don't stop and give him praise. That was Israel's problem, is that Okay, they're, they're, the water is bitter. Okay, let's complain. God sweetens the water. Then they get to the next scene. There's no bread. Wait a minute, hold up. What did he just do back here? He took bitter water and said, throw some trees in the water. How does throwing trees in the water make bitter water sweet? That's a miracle. And then Moses says, here it is. God is your healer. Okay, I need to take that and take that to my next problem. But we don't do that. We go right back to where Israel is and we complain over again. It says what God did in the past, he can't do no more. Gives them, gives them bread. We ain't got no meat. Wait a minute, he just brought bread from heaven. <laughs> he just brought food from the sky. And you just pick it up and eat it and he gives you the portion that you need each day. That's a miracle. But we don't think about it. And we run to the next problem. Can he give us meat? Then he causes a wind and quail come and sit outside their tents. Go out there and they're going to sit there and let you kill them and eat them. That's a miracle. But in every case, with all of us, God, it may not be a miraculous uh, thing that God does. It may be just through the work of providence. God just supernaturally orchestrates our situation, blesses us. And we don't stop and say, thank you. We don't stop and meditate. What has he just shown himself, shown us about himself that I need to take to the next test he brings my way? I'm preaching to myself tonight. This is my sin oftentimes of murmuring and complaining in my heart against the Lord. 
because I just don't want to be bothered with a problem. But my life is not about me and what I want. It's about God putting himself on display so I may worship him. I was made for him. He, wasn't, he doesn't exist for me. Not in that way. Then we invert it and then he's the, he's the genie and we just got to rub the lamp and, and, and tell him what our wishes are. So this study of being centered on God, it has to be a, a, a high and exalted view of God, that he's God all by himself, that we don't do nothing um, to add to him. Uh, here, this is another section that Israel got it wrong. We get it wrong. Turn to Isaiah 66 and, and, and let's put it on the, on the screen for us. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse one, one of my favorite verses. I heard a preacher preach this and it just stayed with me. Uh, his observation of the text and how he broke it down. Uh, just bless my soul. Isaiah 66, verse one. Just read this, okay? And Israel was in this habit of sinning against the Lord and thinking that by, the, by bringing their sacrifices to God, um, that God would somehow or another just be pleased, that you just give God your leftovers. Um, you know, we just, we just uh, you know, give God leftover. We don't have to give him our hearts. We just give him our time. And, and God ought to be impressed that we give him a little couple of hours on Sunday. You know, we come to church and we come. And if we're good, you know, we're real Christians. You know, I'm, I'm being facetious. But if we're sanctified Christians, we come at 930, right? And then we come to morning service. And then we come to evening service. We gave God his due. Okay, God ought to be pleased. And Isaiah 66, verse 1, you need to understand something about God. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What then is a, is a house you can build for me? Your house of worship, what you're trying to build does nothing for me. I sit on heaven and you, I, I put my foot on the earth. And, and, and it's a reminder, right? When I was in my grandmama's house and I was, all of us had that living room where it was all plastic on the, on the sofa, right? And it was the living room I, I, I could not go through. I could not play in that living room. And, and God forbid I would go into that living room with the plastic on the chairs and on the sofa and put my foot on my grandmother's table, right? She would go off on me. Uh, my feet are dirty. You don't put it on something that's precious like my table. Well, earth, no matter how precious earth might be to you, God puts his foot on earth and he sits on heaven. What's the house you can build for me? Where's the place that I might rest? For my hands, verse two, made all these things the material that you're using, the rock, the stones, I made that. The martyr that you're using, you, that came from the ingredients from my creation. All these things came to being, declares the Lord. But to this one, I will look to him who is humble and contrite to spirit, who trembles at my word. If you want God's attention, it's not seeking to do something for God in the sense that you think by doing something from him, giving your money, you giving something God lacks, and you're doing God a favor. No. God owns your money. He's the one that gave you the money. He's the one that gave you the job. He gave you the sense and he gave you by his providence, the ability to get an education, gave you favor with your boss for them to hire you to make the money that you have. And so he can take that away from you if you want, if he wants to. So whatever we give to God, we never think we're giving out of the fact that God has a need for it. We give really as an expression of faith, acknowledging you are the giver and we, and we are giving to you what actually belongs to you by faith, believing that what we give to you, you will continually take care of us. It's an act of faith. So to this one, if you want God's attention, verse two says of Isaiah 66, to this one I will look, to who's humble and contrite of spirit who trembles at my word. How do we get God's attention? You want God's attention. You don't feel like God is hearing you. you. You want God's favor to be upon your life. It begins this way. Be humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What's a humble person? Well, the second word there, humble and contrite. Um, contrite, the Hebrew actually was used of Mephibosheth. He was a cripple. That's the, 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 the Hebrew word used for contrite. Mephibosheth, you know, he was the son of Jonathan, Jonathan being the son of Saul and David. Uh, and I believe it's 1 Samuel, I think it's, no, 2 Samuel 8, I believe. Um, I want to I want to fulfill the covenant promise I made to, to, to Jonathan. I want to I show favor. I want to show loving kindness to his house. And 
They said his, his, his son named Mephibosheth, he's crippled in both legs. How do you want, how do you get God's attention? Recognize that all of us are spiritually disabled. And as it says in John 15, five, apart from Jesus, apart from me, you can do nothing. God is looking to give grace to people who realize they can't do nothing about him. I'm praying because Lord, I realize this issue is beyond me. God will show you grace. Uh, this problem that I'm having with my kids or in my marriage, just, I can't fix it. You know, you know, the, the phrase that uh, I was having a conversation with a couple of people and the I actually got this phrase from my son, uh, uh, Jeremiah. He, he's, all of my sons have unique personalities. Jeremiah in the house, he's the one that's sort of like matter of fact, he doesn't really trip off of anything. Uh, and when he was young, he had scarlet fever and his skin was like sandpaper. And he was like five years old. I'm like, how did you get scarlet fever? And the doctor was amazed, like, he should be crying. He was like, it is what it is, <laughs> you know? And then that phrase, you know, it is what it is. It, it, it kind of gets us sometimes. It, 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 life is, it is what it is. It's nothing, I can't, I can't, I can't change it. I can't change my, my kids' hearts. I can't change my situation with my, my marriage. I can't change my job situation. It is what it is. And that best basically acknowledge me that I, I can't fix this, but God will look to you when you realize you already are disabled. The problem is you don't know you're disabled. That's the hardest thing about being a caregiver is that you care for people, your loved ones who don't believe that they're disabled and they try to do things they can't do no more. I'm dealing, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with a, you know, situation in my family where, uh, you know, I have a loved one who can't do for himself no more, but he doesn't know he can't do for himself. And, he, and it, it just becomes a difficult thing. You know, he has short-term memory, dementia. He's trying to drive. I'm like, he can't drive anymore, but he doesn't believe that. But the caregiver can only help when the person who acknowledges, I can't, I can't do this no more. I need you help me. And the proud person is saying, no, I don't need God. But God says, yes, you do need me. No, I'm gonna keep doing it my way. And God says, okay, I'll let you, I'll let you stumble till you get to the point you realize, apart from me, you can do nothing. And if and the reason why you and I come to church, because we realize I need the Lord. I'm not doing God a favor like he needs me. He's doing me a favor. I need him. I'm, I'm in the word. I'm in prayer. I need these, I need these crutches just to help me to make it through the day. Am I, am I making sense? Um uh, there's so many verses with that. And, you know, if you get time, you turn to Jeremiah chapter two, and he says, you know, I'm the fountain of living waters. You, and you take in broken cisterns that can't hold water. Fountain of living waters. I'm a self-replenishing fountain. You don't pour water into this fountain in order to get water. You come to me, the water's already there. And all you got to do is testify that that water is good. That's what worship is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You don't make him good. You don't make him glorious. You only acknowledge what he already is. That's the doctrine of aseity. That's the doctrine of God's self-sufficiency. That's how it ministers to us. So God sets up our lives. I'm preaching to myself. He sets up my life. He sets up your life. And um, there was a preacher, I forgot his name, years ago. He was back in, I think, the 1800s. He was pacing back and forth one day. And someone asks, what's wrong with you? And he says, the problem is I'm in a hurry and God isn't. <laughs> Have you ever been there before? You want your schedule to go a certain way and it doesn't seem that God is allowing your circumstances to go at the pace that you want. Um, it is what it is. And I have to realize, you know, my, my arms are too short to box with God. And, 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 and really just accept the setup that God has me in and trust that he wants to put himself on display for his glory and my good. Am I making sense? This is why Reformed theology being centered on God is so important. As we see God for who he is, we see ourselves as we really are. Nothing apart from him. And when we think we can do things apart from him, we're going to find frustration, worry, being overwhelmed, stressed out, flat out just wanting to give up. And God's just simply saying, hey, uh, you need to keep your mind and your focus on me. Yes, I can do all those things. There's no limits to my power. Uh, 
but it's not about my ability. It's about my will, my will. That's why the disciples' prayer is thy will be done. And we, we want that, but the problem is we say that, but we really want our will to be done. And that's the problem. It's not that God's wrong, it's that we're wrong. We want to compete with God. We want to be our own God. We want things to go our way. As I said before, worry is really uh, pride, right? It's, 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 it's really uh, pride, essentially, worry is essentially upset that you can't play God. Because if you were God, you wouldn't worry about nothing. If you have power and authority over all your situations, everything will go the way you want it. So worry is future focused. You're worrying about things that hasn't happened yet. But at its root, worry is pride because you can't stand that you're not God. Because if you were God, you can control your future. And your future is in his hands. And sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes I don't like it. That's the flesh. That's, what, that's the enemy of God is your flesh. It's my flesh. And God says, I'm going to get that flesh. I'm going to humble you. I'm going to subdue that flesh so that you will say, uh, God's will is good. You ever been brought to that point? You go through something you didn't want to go through, and at the end of it, you give him praise. God subdued your will, made you focus on him. And it helped you and I to see that he's good. He's good. He's the father, we're the children. We don't know what's best for us. We don't know what's best for us. Um, so we talked about that a little bit last week. I think we used the analogy of Popeye's chicken, right? And did I use that analogy last week? Maybe I didn't. There was a preacher who was preaching and uh, sharing about God being omnipotent and omnipresent. It was really in the context of Jeremiah's uh, Jeremiah 20, where Jeremiah was complaining, Lord, you tricked me. You deceived me. You put me in the ministry, and uh, I thought things would go the way that I would like them to go, and you tricked me into this, and and he was just, the preacher was just talking about how, you know, we know God's all-powerful and, and everything. Is he omnibenevolent? Is he all good? And the question, the answer to the question, he is all good, but oftentimes we don't think he's all good, and because there's things that we feel he takes from us, or doesn't give us that we feel that we need or makes us happy. And the omnibenevolence of God, that God is always good, helps us that when things don't go the way we want it, we know God is doing this for my good. Somehow or another, he's doing this for my good. All things work together for my good. And so the preacher was sharing this. He was saying he was at Popeye's. That's his favorite place to eat, Popeye's. And he was sitting there in Popeye's eating. And he noticed a mother and a daughter eating. And the mother had given her baby daughter, who had no teeth, a, a chicken leg, a chicken leg. And, and the baby was taking that chicken leg and was just gnawing on that chicken leg. I mean, ate up all the skin on the chicken leg, started getting down to the meat of the chicken leg and just tearing it up with no teeth. He's like, look at that. And so it got to the point she was down to the gristle of the, of, of the, of the, of the chicken leg. And then the little baby started gnawing on the bone. And when the bone started getting soft, the mother took the bone away. And guess what the baby did? Started crying. The mother was good to give the baby the skin, the meat, and the gristle. But when she knew that the baby would get down to the bone, she knew that bone would hurt that child. And in love, she snatched it away. And does not the Lord do that with us sometimes? He gives us blessings upon blessings, but there are certain things that he notices that's not good for us. It's actually dangerous for us. That he doesn't, that he takes away or doesn't give us. And we 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 cry, we mope, we get upset, not knowing that was love. That's the omnibenevolence of God. It was the love of God that did that for us. And we have to preach that to ourselves. We have to preach that to ourselves. When times get hard, God, you're good. It's like the, you know, Job had to preach that to himself. God is given, God is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I I, I can't get into the mind of God. I don't understand why he chose to do it this way. I don't, I don't understand why he would do this to me, but I do know one thing, God is good and everything that I have is a gift. And, and I, 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 I bless his name. You can do that while you're weeping. That doesn't mean you don't trust him. It doesn't mean you're not believing in him. It doesn't mean that you're trying to convey God's not good. You can weep and, and hurt and be broken 
and still say, you're still good, God. You're always good. So uh, let me just give this last paragraph. We got five minutes left. On page eight, under the holiness of God, there's this last paragraph here before we transition to based on God's word alone. Uh, the, the paragraph above number two, you have this statement. Uh, keep going up, my brother. The last paragraph, uh, right under, yeah, right there. Um, a distortion of the character of God poisons the rest of our theology. A lot of our frustration is that we have a concept of God that misrepresents him. And we're believing the lie about God, thinking it is God. So a distortion of the character of God poisons the rest of our theology. We got to take all that the Bible says of God revealing himself in scripture. He is sovereign. He is good. He is righteous in all his ways. Uh, the uh, R.C. Sproul made the statement, God cannot do, God can do nothing but what is right. God cannot do nothing but what is right. And so if I'm accusing God of being wrong, I my that that thinking process is poisoned who god truly is god does no wrong he cannot lie the ultimate form of idolatry is humanism which regards man as a measure of all things i god is only good as it accords to him doing things that i want him to do if i perceive of anything happening in my life that i do not like god is wrong that's humanism man is a measure of all things we're saying in Reformed theology, God is the center. Okay, God is the center. Man is the primary concern, the central focus, the dominant motif of all forms of humanism. We say secular humanism, basically we're saying is, is that man is the measure. We wanna make man the measure in our society. If I don't get my rights, somebody did me wrong. That's secular humanism. You hear it everywhere, right? I got my rights do whatever I want on my property, do whatever I want. That's secular humanism. We reject that. that that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a form of a philosophy, idolatry that opposes the true God. Um, um, I have a responsibility before this God and uh, to worship him in a way that uh, he has revealed himself. So that concludes, Lord willing, next week we're going to look at point number two, that reform, the foundations of reform theology is based on God's word alone. Before I conclude, are there any questions before I uh, conclude our time? Any questions? If you have your video on, raise your hand. If you don't, you can put a comment. Again, um, you have my email address and please, uh, I welcome questions. I welcome questions that I, I hope that will, again, and don't, don't feel too, when you have a question, best believe others have a question as well. So let's uh, try to interact as the best way we can. Before we conclude, again, want to give you uh, my email again for questions. Please, uh, please feel free to send that to me. Also, let's pray again for the evangelism outreach on this coming Thursday at six o'clock at Douglas Park. We'll be praying for Brother Corey Edmund as he brings the word and and uh, let's, let's make ourselves known. There are people out there that, that, that don't know our great God. And he has left us here to be a witness, to draw the lost to himself, that he might show himself glorious. Amen. Amen. So uh, that concludes our time. One of three methods of giving. Reminded that the, to keep uh, giving as the Lord has so blessed you. We have our online giving, right? We have our mail-in offering, our drop-off. And so... Lord willing, next month we'll have a church meeting. We want to update you all about matters concerning the city. And uh, of course, we get the budget in that meeting as well. So you'll know where things are as far as our, our weekly needs for the various, um, you know, responsibilities that we have with our facilities and, and staffing and, and all that, how that is all a part of our, us being able to gather together to have a healthy ministry. So we'll update you on that. I always want to try to do my best for us to be uh, on the same page and, you know, be transparent with you all. So again, that's our four points of prayer, praying for myself and the pastoral leadership. Please keep Pastor Bob lifted up and Elder C. Elder C, you can put him on your prayer list. He's having some soreness, some pain in his mouth. He has to go to the dentist 
and uh, be praying for him. Pray for our property needs slash parking needs, our financial needs, as well as our church unification. Amen. I always uh, covet your prayers. Please keep me lifted up. Okay, with that, let us uh, conclude our time in prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you for our, your word. We thank you for your glory, O oh, oh Lord, as you've shown of yourself in scripture. And I pray that you would incline our hearts to the reality of who you reveal yourself to be in the word. Lord, we have the flesh in us that often tempts us to doubt you, to question you, to complain against you. Forgive us of our sins, O oh Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Help us, O oh God, to think your thoughts after you, Lord. Uh, help us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may know your good and perfect and acceptable will. Anyone on this uh, study tonight that's just feeling downcast, oh God, lift their spirits. Remind them that you love them, oh God. Remind them, oh God, that you're going to work all things together for their good. Remind them, oh God, that you humble them, that they may look up to see you and to know that you're the God of deliverances. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are safe. Also, Lord, I pray that you would guard us from the evil one who wants to uh, sow lies into our minds. Guard us from the flesh that oftentimes tempts us to think carnally. Guard us from the world that wants to be so intrusive uh, and imposing their ideologies, their lies upon us. Help us to be discerning, O oh God, in this day and age. Bless you, O oh God. Provide for our needs according to your riches and glory. We thank you for our time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, Main Street.